So, hi, I'm Lauren Tackett. I go to ASU. I actually know all of these people in the chat, so. Um, but, so today I'm just going to be going over um, some pieces from the 1940s um, and how African-American artists in particular kind of just saw, like, you know, okay. <laughs> how they just created pieces that, you know, showed their experience in America and how, especially in most of, I mean, up until now, but especially in the 1900s, just how like the racial context affected, you know, the publicity and kind of like exposure that a lot of these artists got or just like how much you learn about them. Cause like, I mean, you learn about Caso and, you know, all these other artists, but I mean, there was some of these pieces that even I'm going over now that I didn't see until recently, just because of how whitewashed our kind of education about different artists and just different pieces can be. So here, let me share my screen. Okay. Okay. So I titled it, uh, A Picture is Worth a Thousand Words, How African-American Artists Saw America in Times of Chaos and Calm. And I kind of, I chose chaos and calm just because I wanted to focus on, again, like the racial context of a lot of these paintings and when they were made and, you know, what was going on, but also um, just some of the content and like in Jacob Lawrence's painting, they still are sitting in like a segregated diner. It's the first one, but it's more of like a calm type of picture, I guess, like, so. I wanted to just see how those two contrast. But so the first one that I wanted to go over is called Let My People Go by Aaron Douglas. And for all of the pieces that I'll go through this summer, I kind of broke it down into form, function, content, and context. Just kind of when I took art history class, that's how we broke it down and how we used all these different elements to kind of create a broader learning of all of the paintings. So I kind of wanted to include that. So hey, Laura, you know? oh. could you run it as a slideshow so we can see the yeah. image better? Thank you. Yes, yes. <laughs> Sorry, I got all going. <laughs> okay. So the medium is oil and masonite. So that's like the acrylic oil. And then the masonite is a type of wood that they're using. And then all of these paintings, or these three paintings that I'll go through at least, are from the night like 1935 to about 1943. So also around the time of World War II. Um, and so this was actually, so it's 48 inches by 36 inches. And then I included the style, which was like the Harlem Renaissance. And although like, you know, it's not like specifically it doesn't specifically show like the Harlem Renaissance, you know, it's how the Harlem Renaissance and that context kind of influenced how this piece was made. Um, okay, so form. So Douglas used like a flat kind of silhouetted style and a big thing for Douglas, which I'll talk about with function, is he wanted to kind of connect um, African-American artists and African art and bring those two together and create like this unity between them. And so the flat silhouetted style is actually a part of traditional African themes. And here I'll go back. He used um, kind of lavender and golden hues. And it said that it was to show like kind of how nature contrasts with the people and kind of also just, you know, highlight the different aspects of the piece. Um, and so being that it was the 1940s he, or, and the Harlem Renaissance, he was still using aspects of modernism, but combined them with the African art history. So he used like a dimensional perspective and the angular shapes. And then again, like the lavender and the yellow contrast, he used those unexpected colors to kind of get that. Um, and then with the oil and masonite, like I was talking about earlier, um, doing it on that kind of surface kind of diminished the oil, the oily look. 
and it made it so it was less resistance to warping over time. Okay, hold on, I have to move this so I can see this. Um, and for his function, which was what was his intended purpose in creating a piece like this, um, he wanted to address the racial and the segregation issues that were going on in America. I mean, slavery had been ended for now about 60 years, but Jim Crow was in swing and he really wanted to, you know, highlight the post. Um, and he, like I said, he created this unity between the African art and the art that like African-American artists were making or just African-Americans in general <clears throat> by using like an emphasis on the African art. And so in their art, it's more um, imagery centered and their form is more in imagery centered. And so here, I'll go back. in this picture, you can kind of see shapes and people, but nothing's very specific. And he did that also to make it somewhat symbolic and show that, you know, because I'll later get into it, but this is, um, the content of this is related to Moses leading the Israelites um, out of Egypt. And so he kind of wanted to draw between those two and make it so, I mean, even, I mean, that was thousands of years ago to now, how you could connect just the same type of situations in the context. And so he wanted to make the form of it very symbolic, um, but also very general, so it could relate to many different times. Um, okay. that. Um, so context, what was happening historically and culturally. So in the 1940s was the Harlem Renaissance, um, and Douglas was a major figurehead of this, you know, this artistic movement, and he worked with the Harlem Artists Guild and at Fisk University and taught at Fisk University and really wanted to increase um, young African-American artists um, educational access and their career opportunities um, at the Fisk University and just all around. And also, um, I learned about this when I was researching was the New Negro Movement and it promoted a renewed sense of racial pride, culture, self-expression, economic independence, and progressive politics. And so in this hub of Harlem in New York City, they really wanted to foster just a cultural component and, you know, art was a very predominant form of that and it, it showed how, you know, what they had been going, it kind of allowed for a final, like a sense of expression. <laughs> um, but they really wanted to foster more participation in American society and, you know, get their pieces out there and, you know, get the recognition that a lot of these artists did not have. Okay. And then context. So, or content, what is the subject matter of this piece? So, like I said earlier, this piece is from a story from the Old Testament and it depicts uh, God's order to Moses to leave the Israelites out of Egypt. And uh, Douglas used this story because he wanted to draw similarities between the oppression that the Israelites face and the oppression that African Americans face in America. And so there's soldiers on horsebacks and there's waves and there's pharaohs and everything. And it's just a lot of, it's also very crowded. And so it's a lot of just contrast between nature, like I was saying earlier, nature and the figures that are actually in it. Um, and this piece is part of a series of eight different pieces. And they're from the, they're supposed to go along with these poems um, by James Weldon Johnson called, called God's Trombones, Seven Negro Sermons in Verse. And then like, yeah, like I was saying, he wanted to connect the past and the present of black slavery and just how it kind of still seeped into, you know, America in the 1940s and 1930s. And so, okay. And so that's kind of that one. I'm gonna go through all of them and kind of just give a broad history and then I will go at the end, I'll like open it up and we can talk about them and I'll pull them back up again. But I'm gonna go to the next one. 
Okay. So this is The Migration of the Negro, panel number 49 by Jacob Lawrence. And he used a uh, case in tempera on hardboard to create this. And it was made in 1940, 1941. And it's actually part of a series of a hundred different um, panels that he made. So he kind of made them all over this time. And then the size is 18 inches by 12 inches. And again, this was made like during the Harlem Renaissance and kind of with that Harlem Renaissance style. So, okay. Oh my gosh. Okay. okay. And so how this was made, um, actually hold on. Okay. So he used casein tempera and it's a milk protein and so it kind of helps create the like chalky kind of look that it has. And he did this because he was creating a series of 100 panels and so he wanted to get consistency across all these panels and use the same colors. And so he actually set them all up at the same time or like he would set up a large amount at the same time and so he could go and apply the color onto one and onto the same color on one and another and then kind of go back and do that. And so this medium allowed him to not only use it on multiple different things, but kind of just create that continuity. Um, and the image itself, it is cold and kind of stiff just with the dark colors and the contrast between, you know, having it on a gray background that already creates kind of cold mood. And so it's also the, many of the figures in this painting aren't very individualized. Um, the two white men on the left side have, you know, facial expressions, but other than that, they're pretty general too. And I think that goes along with what Douglas was trying to do and trying to make his figures more symbolic and representational of whole and just show that like, I mean, this was happening everywhere and anywhere to anyone in the 1930s and 40s. Um, and so this entire series of 100 paintings um, depicts the Great Migration, which was when um, after slavery ended and after um, the slaves were freed, essentially, they wanted to move to the north because the south was still very plantation based and the business was very like labor based. And many of them were attempting to kind of just get out of that environment. And so they, there was a mass movement of, I think, six million um, African Americans that moved from the south to the north. And for them, they were thinking that the south was just so racist, and so filled with discrimination that they would go to the north and it would kind of be better but the north was still um, filled with racism and it had seeped into the aspects of their life as well and he talks about how the change in the north were still there they were like similar to the change that slaves felt in the or were chained within the south but the change there were more invisible and more cultural I guess, and societal. They weren't physical, but you could still feel that restraint. And this um, migration also included um, the boom of Harlem as like a cultural hub. And so the Harlem Renaissance was the golden age for many African-American artists and singers, musicians, and authors really just to kind of like they were attempting to do when moving from the south to the north to, you know, broaden culture and live freer and be able to express themselves in ways that traditionally they just hadn't been able to. Um, and so although there was this explosion, many African, Amer or African Americans still found themselves in a racist and segregated America that um, they were trying, like Lawrence was trying to depict in this entire series that you know, it was still very relevant. And even if they were allowed to sit in 
you know, a diner like this, it was segregated and it wasn't the North that they were expecting it to be. Let me, let me get some water real quick. So the function of this piece and the purpose Jacob Lawrence had in creating this entire series and this piece specifically was he wanted to illustrate that unexpected prejudice that African Americans face when they move to the North. I, I believe that many of them still realize that, I mean, America as a whole was, you know, racist, but since the South was so overtly racist, I think they didn't expect to face such, like, or not face, face similar restraints and kind of racism that wasn't, it wasn't as overt in the South, but it was still there and it was still harmful to just their expression in their life. Um, so this, um, like I was saying earlier when I was discussing content, this is shown in the panel 49, which portrays the segregation and having the physical, the yellow part in the back, the physical barrier kind of emphasizes that segregation that was just very strong in American society. And so I think he did that very symbolically too, including that um, physical separation. Okay, so content. So of this 100 panel series, um, each panel had an accompanying sentence with it. And so this panel, um, their sentence was, they also found discrimination in the North, although it was much different from what they had known in the South. And so in this case, in this piece itself, their discrimination came in where they were able to eat and kind of, you know, their ability to be seated around people of different colors or races. Um, and so, like I was talking about, there's the physical boundary that separates the two, but Jacob Lawrence also made it so the white men on the left had more facial expressions and they look, at least the one on the bottom looks kind of physically agitated and he looks a little disgruntled, like he's upset about his eating situation. Um, but Lawrence didn't give any faces to um, the black patrons on the right and just kind of made it so they were eating their meals, but um, most of them were looking down and, you know, I think he specifically didn't give them expressions because he wanted to show the contrast in attitudes. And so show that, you know, these whites were upset that they had to eat with African-Americans and that they were in, even in the same diner where, you know, these African-American patients were simply just trying to eat and trying to, you know, get a meal. So, okay. And so that's it for that one. And then the last piece that I wanted to go through was the Contrib Contribution of the Negro to Democracy in America by Charles White. And for the medium, he used egg tempura. And this is actually the latest of the three um, pieces. And so this was made in 1943. And the size is, it's 18 feet by 12 feet milestone because it actually is a mural um, in, at Hampton University on one of the walls there. And so it's, I mean, extremely large <laughs> and his style was similar to that of the Harlem Renaissance but he was based in Chicago and so his is more like a Chicago black renaissance that took similar like stylistic features but was a little different from what was going on in Harlem so I kind of made it so you could still see you know the piece while I was talking about it. But this piece was made by using um, egg tempura and it's where you create, um, you mix egg yolk with water and make it a binder and then you add the pigments and so it helps create layers and kind of 
you know, use as for a longer time. It doesn't take as long to dry, so it's easier to go over. And he does, he, painting this mural, he didn't have to wait as long as he would if he were to have chosen oil as the medium. And during this time, like I was talking about with Picasso being around at this time as well, the art world was kind of heading towards a more abstraction type of um, view or, and depiction, but White really wanted to focus on representational style. And so he achieved this by using like a very distinct and labor intensive approach. And as you can see, there's many levels in, I mean, it is all kind of layered on top of each other and kind of a little more abstract in that way, but he really wanted to like be representational with what he was doing and how he was creating it. Okay. Let me skip. <laughs> so his White's purpose in creating this piece was to kind of promote public knowledge about African American history and the characters and the people that went and added to this. And so um, he wanted to kind of correct the whitewashing that had occurred in school and had um, been taught and just educate education across the board. And so it was part of a collection of murals actually that focused in on resistance and um, empowerment and slavery. And so it was really trying to invoke like this is the history that is being glossed over in our history books, but this is just as much of American history as the white, you know, artists and historical leaders that we learn about. Um, it also worked to illustrate the reality of the black community's fight for racial equality. And so this was a very broad fight in he wanted to use murals that were available to everyone and that anyone could see and anyone could participate in and not have it just be some piece in a museum that, you know, some people will get to see at some point. He really wanted to make it local and, you know, kind of feasible to everyone to be able to go there and experience what he was doing. Okay, and then like I was saying earlier, um, this piece is located at Hampton University and it's located on the second story um, of one of the buildings there and you can go and see it at any time and just kind of be in awe of it and it being so big, I think you could kind of just look up and just really sit, take it in. I think that's what his purpose was for making it a mural. Um, so the content of his mural, so he, like I was saying with his function, he wanted to correct the whitewashing that had occurred in American education. And so the mural depicts many black historical figures of American history. And so um, Harriet Tubman is in here and Nat Turner, Frederick Douglass, Brooke T. Washington, George Washington Carver, um, Crispus Attucks, and he wanted to draw them and many other figures in, oh, I'm so sorry, in this exaggerated state to highlight the strength behind not only the movement behind these characters and these people. Um, and that's why he included lots of powerful hands because he wanted to emphasize that, you know, this fight for racial equality is made up of so many people and strong people truly like putting physical work and time and effort into a cause that they were having to continue and continue to fight for. And so he really wanted to just highlight the strength that was in all of these figures. Um, so historically, part or Okay. 
So growing up, um, he was a big influence to many different artists, but he growing up had a tough financial situation. And so he just wanted to paint on whatever he could get his hands on and, you know, just kind of let it out. And it said he painted on like papers and bookcases. And I mean, I, when I first saw that, I was thinking of like chalk, you know, just getting, getting his ideas out in any way he could. And so I think that also contributed to him creating murals and just kind of, you know, I feel like murals aren't as restricting as a canvas. Like you truly have so much space and so much, you know, room to work with that I think his earlier life and not being able to have these canvases, you know, pushed him to kind of use murals as his, as his canvas. <laughs> and so when he was young, he moved to Mississippi to live with his aunts and he learned about African-American soul, South folklore, um, which heavily influenced his art and what he created. And so when he was a teen and he moved back to Chicago and he became the house artist at the National um, Negro Congress in Chicago. And this was a broad based group that kind of fought for black liberation and um, especially in economic um, situations as well. And so he was an important figure in this kind of Chicago black renaissance and this cultural movement that was happening. I mean, not only in Harlem, but in Chicago and other places in the North as well. Okay, let me, so I finished going over them, okay. So I'm going to stop screen sharing. Um, okay. So I kind of just, I wanted to give kind of the content and all of that in the context behind all the pieces and then just kind of, I didn't send them um, to be posted on the website, but I also know that when I was learning about these pieces in like different art history classes or just art pieces in general, like seeing it there in the class and learning about it and kind of just taking in that full, um, you know, situation of it helped, you know, evoke lots of different feelings. And so I kind of wanted to show and then have, you know, you guys talk about how you felt about them or what kind of emotions or ideas it provoked in you if anyone has any, and I can, hold on, I can pull it back up. Okay. Okay. So this was the first one by Aaron Douglas. And so, I just, what was any, what were any of your guys like reactions to it, or what did you think about it, or the context or content of it? Hey, Lauren, I think um, I think Dr. Seagrave had to leave, but he left a question about this particular image in the chat, um, and maybe we could start with that too. That's a great question about the storm clouds. He said. Um, uh still with the same one. Um, he said, uh, one question about the let my people go piece. What do you make the storm clouds in the upper right hand corner contrasting with the sun shining down on the individual coming from the left corner? So um, I think it's a question that asks about the symbolism right in this in this piece. Um, which I think, in my view, um, helps us think about the complexity of this story, right? That mm -hmm. there's both, that there's both um, pain and there's also potential, you know, there's also yeah. hope, you know, and I think exactly. the storm clouds are the pain while the, while the sunshine on the left hand 
corner is the hope for some kind of redemption. Um, and I think that's, that may be what um, Aaron Douglas was, was thinking about. Yeah, no, I definitely, looking at it now, I definitely agree that, um, and especially with him trying to connect it back to, I mean, the story from the Old Testament and just kind of, mm -hmm. you know, slavery, he was showing that there are, with this instance, when they were leading him out of Egypt, like, there are instances of hope and, you know, that freedom, but that doesn't mean that the fight for the racial equality is ever kind of, is, or is done, like, there's still... Right. the storm clouds that you have to face and have to go through. And so I think that was mm -hmm. definitely something too. Mm -hmm. yeah. I love this point that um, Mara is bringing up, um, that um, what really stood, stood out to her is the use of the purple color and the let my people go piece. Seems like such a soft, unlikely color to utilize, especially when dark people, dark purple is usually <laughs> connotated or yeah with royalty and passion I think that's a, a, a really great point as well um, it makes me it, it reminds me of as since I study music it reminds me of music that is so soft and gentle like the song strange fruit by Billie Holiday it's so mm -hmm. such a lovely tune you know but it's really it really has a, a, a powerful um, searing message and I, I think that the point that Mara is bringing up is is how, and I love how you, you said form, function, content, and, and, and context, all those seem to work well together and get to the bottom of the point that Mara is trying to raise, right? These mm -hmm. colors. No, yeah, I definitely agree. And especially I was, when you started talking about music, like Strange Fruits was the first song that popped into my head too. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. it really is very light and then mm -hmm. you listen to just the lyrics and it's, very dark and so it definitely contrasts like this picture does too. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so. And one of the questions actually too that I wrote down that I can just kind of say right now is um, why, and like I talked about in the beginning, how I titled it Chaos and Calm. Um, like this piece itself is more of like a chaotic piece. And so, but the context behind it, I mean, it was like the Harlem Renaissance and like trying to be it, calmer in a sense, I guess, like trying to, you know, have all this cultural expression. But I do think that like the contrast behind still shows the history of everything and shows that like, you know, even though they had this time to like culturally, you know, many artists were able to like express themselves, there was still there's still this history behind it and there's still all that. So, okay, we'll go to the next one. And so, I know actually, so I know most of the people in this chat took the same art history class that I did. And so we actually learned about this in our class. And so I was wondering if they had any thoughts that they wanna share in the chat about it. <laughs> or what you thought of it, Stephanie, too. Mm -hmm. um, no, this one is so different from, from the first one, and I'd love to hear what you art history experts have to, have to say, because I'm not an expert. Um, but, um, but just in terms of the ways in which art can be used as an expression, I think translates between visual art and musical art as well. Um, and I think this one is so stark. You know, I think you're analysis is is on point um, looking at how um, the that that um, that line between mm -hmm. them really is a, a significant a signification of of segregation and what it is that the that the Harlem Renaissance was all about was to sort of fight against these kinds of of boundaries and see if we could get those boundaries down um, hate to bring up music again, but so many times in the in that ha first half of the 20th century, when musicians would would want to go, even Billie Holiday, you know, wanting to go and play music or sing at a, at concerts, and she being told to go through the back of the 
of the concert hall and then all the musicians that she would work with who may have were many of them were white were allowed to come in through the front door you know or even in the 60s when people like james brown or um steve not not so much stevie but james brown and some other artists would go to a, a an event and say that they wouldn't play unless that that um barrier came down so it's so, such a, a reflection of that moment or the multiple moments when black people were segregated and, and set aside um, and set apart from, from the rest of the, um, of the, of the people. I, I also even think that Jacob Lawrence, um, if you look at the chairs that the white men are sitting on versus the chairs that the uh, black folks are sitting on, you know, they're much bigger chairs, you know, mm -hmm. they have a table to themselves. And, um, and I think that that's, that's interesting as well. They've got a menu, they can choose what they want, you know, so just small exactly. things like that, I think, um, give us so much to think about. Exactly. And I, I should have probably included some of the other panels because I like look through them. And um, this one, like, specifically, it just doesn't kind of, there's a lot of lack of like expression on the people's faces, but like in his other panels, like, where he specifically focused on like, you know, just black people in general, just doing, you know, mundane things like eating or like going out and walking even, he gave them expression. So I think in this piece specifically, it's very intentional that he, one, like took that expression away. And like you were, we were saying, like he created that barrier to kind of show, like he didn't need to put that. Mm -hmm. And I think people could have inferred, you know, at the time that there was this difference, but he was showing that like, this was, it was very distinct, like what they, what the situation was and, you know, mm -hmm. what, like you were saying with the chairs and the menus and the comfort, like mm -hmm. what the contrast was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You guys have anything in the chat room? <laughs> Marina oh. says something. You want to read it out, Lauren? So she said that she agrees <laughs> um, with the last point, but the composition, or in the composition has always stood out to me. Um, it's very flat and angular and muted. So it forces you to kind of focus on this dynamic. Like there isn't a lot of background space too. So it really like, this is the subject. These are the subjects and this is the content, what is happening. Um, and so, yeah, I think Lauren Lawrence was really trying to hone in on that. Oh, and so she was saying that the people aren't really individualized either, which might point to a collective experience regarding race. Mm. And so I think also too, I mean, they, there was more cultural expression, but that didn't mean that like, I mean, when I was going through this and just learning about these artists, you know, I hadn't learned about, I had learned about Jacob Lawrence, but I hadn't learned about Charles White or Aaron Douglas, who are like very prominent figures, but, you know, collectively, we just, we learn about like, we learn about all these white artists, and then we focused on like Jacob Lawrence or Basquiat, but like, those kind of lump every one together, whereas whites had kind of distinctive points and everything, so. Yeah, I think as artists and just as a race in America, like they're kind of lumped together in this collective experience. I agree. <laughs> okay. And then this was the last one. And so were there any strong feelings about this one or just any thoughts kind of that anyone was thinking about when they saw this? <laughs> so, so Lauren, this one lives in at Hampton, right? At Hampton mm -hmm. University, which is of course an HBCU and a historically black college or university. And um, uh, so it can't move. This is like, it's on a wall there, right? Yeah. Um, 
it's that's there it's just on like the second floor <laughs> mm -hmm. that's really interesting um i mean it's 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 even busier than um douglas's work right mm -hmm. um, it's got so much in it and it's um it's just full of stories and layers and so on um it was interesting to me hearing you talk about the different mediums like like the egg stuff, I didn't know anything about the milk stuff. <laughs> I have no idea, um, but 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 I but I love that you you told us those things so that we could understand how they get to because it almost looks not one dimensional. It's not as flat as as the previous one. Um, mm -hmm. It's it's not as flat as Jacob Lawrence's. It's it's it comes it comes alive. It comes to life, think. yeah. Um, and I think that's because of the medium you, you talked about. Um, but yeah, I mean, he covers a lot. Um, my, only, my only question was when I was, the first time I ever saw this, I, I had to sort of look for the women, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, the men are, it's always as usual, um, which goes back to something we discussed. Uh, our previous fellow had talked about black women as well as, um, and so connecting that that note to this piece, thinking about, okay, where are the women? And I'm glad that, that you pointed out that Harriet Tubman is definitely part of this. Yeah, of this I think, yeah, and I think she's right mm -hmm. here. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, yeah, this one definitely like stood out to me too, because I think um, Charles White really wanted to like make his art so accessible and make it strong and I mean like Lawrence was doing something in his piece where showing the segregation but it wasn't as I think this piece is very empowering mm -hmm. and it is very much shows like the work that was put in by so many different people and how it all kind of comes together and I, that goes back to him wanting to try to reverse the whitewashing mm -hmm. of you know American history but I think it's a very powerful piece in general and I was interested by the fact um, that he said that he included like a lot of hands too like a lot of big hands like because there's one I know there's the two up here that are kind of at the at the top kind of holding not holding the piece up I guess but you know I think it shows like the physical work that was like truly put in by so many so yeah I thought this in this piece I mean like I was saying, it being a mural and you just being able to just go and kind of be absorbed by it almost. And just, I'm sure you could spend like hours just looking at every, every detail and every, all the history that was put behind it. And so, okay. Um, so okay. So yeah. Um, Casey was also kind of saying what I was just going on about how it's kind of um, in your face and you, she says, it is so in your face and not easily ignored. Um, I think that has a lot to say about the artist's intent to show how fed up African Americans are with the social or societal, economic and daily challenges they faced. Unlike the other pieces, Charles White depicts his anger in a very upfront manner. I think he wanted to make his white audience uncomfortable in order to force them to see the unjust injustices he and millions of others face. Absolutely. I think that's, uh, that's such an important point. Um, mm -hmm. And I think he's, he's being very assertive here, as, as Casey said. Um, but I also think that there's a, there's a, in terms of function, yes, it functions exactly how, how Casey um, described it. But I think the other side of, of the function is that it also, um, it also functions as an inspiration. Since it's at Hampton, you know, mm -hmm. not a lot of white people go, go to, to Hampton, right? Um, mm -hmm. So a lot of, imagine the scores of African-American students and faculty who, who are on that campus and get to walk by this every day and be inspired by this. I think it, it has sort of those multiple multiple functions um, um, as an art piece to both um, sort of hold, hold people accountable, but mm -hmm. also to um, in, inspire others to, to do better and to keep going, right? Yeah, exactly. 
And yeah, this one, I mean, like going back to my question that I asked about one of the other ones and just how like it kind of contrasts the, the chaos and the calm. But I mean, I think it's like a chaotic piece just with everything that's going on. But like, it's also just interesting. I mean, it's built up so much over time and there's so much like history behind it that it doesn't exactly show like, you know, what was going on in America in the 1940s, at least, um, or at least like very specifically, but it shows just how over time, like the circumstances and just, you know, American history, like what has contributed to everything. And I think also with the name of it, like the contribution um, to democracy, like he really wanted to emphasize that this country was not built you know, just by whites um, and that there's so much history that we like people just need to take account of all the time so I think it's like calm in the sense that it's you know context wise like he's not specifically calling something out like Jacob Lawrence was but I think it kind of shows just the evolution over time um, Okay. Um, trying to see the other message. Oh, okay. So, and then Casey also said, in a modern application, this piece makes me think about how whitewashed our education system is even today. With the Black Lives Matter movement, I, as a white person, also learned a lot about our history things I never learned about in school and events like Juneteenth, June, yeah, Juneteenth, for instance. Yeah, I think that's, that's a critical point that I think should be addressed. Um, and I wonder what you all think about that. You know, why do you think that, um, that this pieces like this were never included? It's never in the canon, right? So these, these artists are not in the canon when mm -hmm. we, Think about art history, you know, as and you know, being in a music school as well. Um, when I look at what's on the canon, it's usually not going to be um, um, artists of color or black artists, certainly. Um, and so, what do you think um, this means? What do you think about the fact that you all are just learning about so many, not all of you, but many of you are just learning about this, these these great works? Um, mm -hmm. And how do you think this can be changed in the future? Yeah. I think personally, yeah, and especially with the Black Lives Matter movement and everything that's happened today, like so many people or so many more people are trying to educate themselves just about, you know, the history that was glossed over and whitewashed in our textbooks. And I think that definitely like the fact that I didn't learn about this in school um, because like you were saying, it doesn't fit into the canon. It really just shows the prioritization that American education has on showing white accomplishments and just white people in general and um, not really celebrating, you know, all aspects of American culture. And so I think that more, not even, I like you were saying, I think with the canon, it's like, I want to learn about these pieces more nonchalantly, I guess. Not nonchalantly, but like, I'm glad like the Black Lives Matter movement is teaching me and so many others about like events like June, Juneteenth and all these other things. But it's like, I, I want us to be able to learn about this stuff in school and have this be, I mean, it's just as vital a part of American history as, you know, all the 4th of July, like, if, you know, but we only celebrate that or we learn about that. And so I think I just want it to be not something that we have to not guess about, but like I was saying, like, it's not like, oh yeah, we're learning about this because we, we have to, or like we we're learning about this because it's our history and it's, it makes America what it is. And so that's at least how I feel. Okay. Yeah, just don't want to type all of this, <laughs> but I was kind of thinking about how if you walk into pretty much any museum, unless it's for a special purpose, but if it's like a general museum, like it becomes a sort of systemic problem of 
you look around and ninety percent of that museum is for like white Eurocentric artists, and each room is like fifty years worth of white art history, and then there's kind of a very tiny little division for like indigenous art or even Asian art or African art. Um, and most of it is stolen as well. <laughs> um, so I, I think like that whole institution of art history, like it's a systemic problem that needs to be broken down and brought back up in order to make it into education in the first place, which is really difficult, but also like crucial. Mm -hmm. I mean, absolutely, Marina. Are you, are any of you planning on going into, um, to get a master's or a PhD in art history? What, what are the plans? Because I think it, it starts, it starts with you all, you know, it starts with, with um, students now at this moment, um, art historians at the, in this moment, really re reshaping and insisting on a reshaping of the, of the field um and a decolonization kind of 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 the ways in which art um and art history are framed and dis and disseminated on every level so so like lauren what what's your plan when you when you graduate or after have you graduated yet no no i'm gonna be a junior okay. um i mean i'm not spe like specifically sure yet um but I'm doing sociology and so I kind of, I really enjoy like learning about how people interact and how, you know, mm -hmm. society just kind of works as a whole. And so I do, th I mean, I've taken art history classes and so I do think that like learning about the different facets of society too and like how they all contribute um, is like I, like, I don't think I'll get a PhD in it, but, or like a master's, but no, I do really enjoy it. And I really just, I want to focus on like directly just helping groups of people mm -hmm. and whether that's, you know, counseling or social work or I don't know, maybe turn, learn, teaching people about art history. Maybe I'll do that, but exactly. yeah, exactly. I know we have like one of, we have a biomed in here. Um, and then one of them is a journalist. And then I think Marina is um, international law or no not law um relations. <laughs> international relations is that what it is yeah okay so not yeah, that's specific, awesome. mm -hmm. <laughs> i mean all of these fields are fields that have issues <laughs> mm -hmm. clearly you know even in international relations or inter or, or law or bio um biomed i mean all these fields are fields that need to pay attention to the kinds of textbooks, you know, mm -hmm. the, the, the kinds of subjects that are covered in those textbooks. I remember going to talk to a nursing, nursing um, class about, about um, race. And, you know, they had never thought about the fact that even those textbooks are written with white people in mind. You, you know, mm -hmm. they, they never thought about, you know, when a black person um, has a bruise, it doesn't turn red, you know, it doesn't turn the same color as, as if it were a white person. So um, mm -hmm. I, think, I think what you're doing here with art is a really great um, model for thinking about other fields and other disciplines um, mm -hmm. that, that we're all engaged in. Yeah. Well, no, and I definitely, I took from what we did in the race in the American story class and like reading to that literature. And I just think that like, more being able to like look at pieces and look kind of just at the expression that's why i mean i called it the, the picture's worth a thousand yeah. words because it really does just especially if people are visual learners too like it really just opens people's eyes to you know yeah. the more education we need and what subjects that they're depicting and so yeah absolutely i'm very excited to keep doing it but <laughs> So speaking speaking of that, Lauren, what's your what's your next? You can you give us a little preview of your your next session, which will be in July. What's what are you going to choose uh, three more pieces? I am. So I think I'm going to do nine total. So then I'll do like three, um, and I'm kind of just going. I think I wanted to kind of go through history at least, mm -hmm. and so like I did this kind of in the '40s, and then um, I know that I want to.
focus on next, I think probably like the 60s um, and like the civil rights movement and kind of art around that. And maybe even like more photographs too, because you know, those are still pieces of art, but like that can really kind of draw it in. But yeah, I was thinking about kind of going to the 60s to maybe like the 80s. And I know that I want to talk about like Basquiat. So um, yeah kind of just moving through history and touching on pieces that have not been given the recognition they deserve. That's great, Lauren. I think, I think you are just about out of time. So, I think so. <laughs> um, thank you so much. Thanks, Casey, Marina, and Mara. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> and thank you, Stephanie, for being here. Of course, of course, this was wonderful. Thanks.